Hello, I'm Dan Biles. Welcome to our fourth episode of Pasco Podcast, a series where we discuss leadership and public service. Now, we'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, the 550,000 plus residents of Pasco County, as represented by the Board of County Commissioners. It's through their trust and empowerment of our workforce and leadership team that we were able to bring you this podcast. We created this podcast to help public servants build leadership skills and leverage them for success by sharing the experiences of our peers. Joining us today for our fourth episode, we have Fire Chief Scott Casson and Deputy Chief of Operations Brian Swartout. Well, welcome. I'm glad you could join us today. Yep, glad to be here. So we'll just kind of start off. Um, tell us a little bit about your leadership philosophy. Well, uh, from a overall simplistic yeah. Yeah. Uh, approach, my philosophy hasn't always been, you know, I start with what's, what's the vision, you know, of the organization. Right. And I start in Pasco County with the county's vision of, uh, you know, being the premier county in, in the state of Florida. And then we, uh, you know, I spent some time with my particular team and we kind of really defined what that is. But then um, once that was defined, then, you know, we have to push it out through the organization and we do that, or at least I do that by hiring the best, right? right. You know, it's one of the principles you learn in, in uh, business school is that you surround yourself with the best people that you can find. And uh, I think we've been very, very successful in, in doing that uh, over the, at least the 10 years that I've been here. Um, and then once I've built that team and, you know, it's, we're continuously building it, um, cause we're expanding and also we've had some retirements over the years. The next thing would be to, uh, make sure that they're, uh, they have the tools necessary to do their job. And that's part of what I need to do, especially at my level and communicating with the board of county commissioners and you as the county administrator to make sure that they, uh, they have that. So very high level, but kind of my simplistic mm -hmm. approach at, and how I, um, you know, how I treat my, my leadership philosophy. Right. Okay. Right. And I suppose for me, um, mine's one of, um, uh, more, a support, uh, I believe in supporting our people. And, um, so servant leadership for me has always been, um, a big part of me just as a person. So, uh, I think the biggest part of leading is listening right. and understanding what people really need and, um, how we can actually get to that end by, um, formulating plans and um, just just looking down the road and uh, moving forward with everything right. we do. So um, that's sort of been my my uh, my belief all right. along right from the beginning um, as a supervisor and then later on uh, as my role has right. changed. Right. And, and people is key to that. You know, servant leadership is really about serving the people, which is why we talk about people a lot and the, our people in the organization. So, you know, you both grew up through firefight being firefighters. So how did you over time develop the leadership skills going from that entry level and brand new firefighter to where you are today, you know, leading a 650 plus organization, uh, firefighters with 26 now career stations. Correct. Yeah. So c give us a little history about how you did that. And then when you decide you thought about when you wanted to lead other people. Well, you know, going all the way back to the beginning, right. it all started with a broken leg on a football field for me. Uh, I had a, a friend of mine uh, that was that was at the the football game, and he went down. And he kind of took control of that in, that incident, and the fire department that responded to the call actually took notice of that and said, "Hey, you should come down and be a part of our cadet program." Because we were high school students, he was a trainer, so that's why he was there. But um, he got involved, so therefore he got me involved. And once I got a bite of the fire service, now I kind of grew up in a family of firefighters. So um, I, everybody but my father really was in the fire service. And so I kind of already knew a little bit about it, but once I actually had an opportunity to become a, a fire cadet and, and get involved, it was, I was hooked. And then I went and I got it right involved with, uh, on the medical side, I became what was called a, that's a first responder, basically. It's a, a basic medical course. And once I took that, I felt empowered. Um, but I also started volunteer for volunteering for a fire department. And once I um, graduated from high school, I started doing this volunteer thing. And there was a call that came out for um, an unconscious person, which was a cardiac arrest. And back then, all volunteers. So we relied on people coming from their home, from work or whoever was available to come down to the fire station, get the equipment and then drive to the scene. Well, I had showed up at the fire station that day and nobody else did. So I, I first of all, I panicked because I wasn't sure what, what I should do. And finally somebody did come 
And, but they were brand new. They didn't know anything. They were just there because they were there. So anyway, we went just the two of us, we took our little rescue squad and we, you know, screamed to this call and it was a cardiac arrest. But, um, my limited knowledge at the time and my very limited experience, I kind of had to take control of that, that scene because there was nobody else. You know, it was me, Uh, this family was relying on me and my training to, to help the situation. And I think it was really that point then that, you know, maybe I do have the ability to lead. And from there, then it was, you know, just throughout the progression of my career. Um, it's all about learning, learning new things. Every day is a learning day. I, I tell all of our new hires during their orientation program, when I address them as a group, that every day is a learning day from the day you start as a firefighter to the, to the day you retire. So I think that's been a, a big component of how I've gotten to where I'm at today. Right. Okay. Right. Well, and in, in, the, in the same way the chief uh, was talking about his early beginnings. So my father was a firefighter. So okay. for me, it wasn't a, a, a huge leap. Um, I got to see him work when I was a, a kid growing up and um, it just it was something I was interested in. So I went a different route. Um, I did become a volunteer for a short period of time, but I ended up going in the Air Force and I went in guaranteed and ended up in uh, fire rescue okay. and uh, later on became a rescueman. So I got to do uh, pilot rescues and I trained for that kind of work. So okay. um, being in the military, of course, they're always pushing leadership and moving forward and and uh, trying to move you to the next level. Um, I did go to NCO uh, school for right. like about a week or so. So that was my first taste of leadership, um, you know, plus uh, you know, you get sent to different duty assignments when you're in the military and, you know, you sort of become a leader or supervisor at some point, um, either whether you're running a crew or you're in charge of a station. So, uh, for me, it was kind of a gradual moving, you know, gradual move forward right. um, in that role. And when I got out, um, you know, I went to civilian firefighting and, um, I was very fortunate to have a lot of really good supervisors that I learned from over the years. So you kind of learn the good and the bad from them. Um, this job is interesting in, in a way and because like the chief was saying, you're always learning. Um, it's every day is a learning day and, um, we all do the same job, but we learn from different people. So we look at things and we approach things differently. So, right. um, if you put four or five of us in a room, we could probably all get the job done, but we would all look at, uh, the way we approach things based on our education and who we learned the job from. Right. So, um, so leadership is just part of what you do in, in the fire service because um, when you're on the street and you're in your beginning phases of learning and you become a supervisor, you're making snap decisions, not unlike you might do in a combat situation, right? So um, until something's before you, you're not really sure how you're going to handle it. And um, when it's a life and death situation and you're looking to save somebody's life or save their property, um, you have to really develop a plan quickly, move on it and be flexible enough to make a change when things aren't going right. So, right. so that's, I think the start of mm-hmm. the whole role as being a leader and, um, that kind of propels you forward. And, um, you know, the thing about what we do now in a situation where I am as, uh, the deputy chief of operations is, is that yeah, we may come across some emergency situations, but we often have time to sit back a little bit and, right. and look at all sides of things before we make decisions. And I think that's a really important uh, part of being a leader is to be able to take everything in, um, look at all different perspectives and get different views from everywhere you can, um, especially from the people that you serve. That right. you serve. And um, and it, it's it's just, a, you know, it's it's a growing thing. It, this is how right. we grow within our, our organization. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned the Air Force firefighting, and you know that was my first experience really with fire rescue. Was as a young lieutenant in the Air Force, civil engineer, and in, in the Air Force fire 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 department's part of the engineering group. And so, right. when we would go to our schools, we get to go into the firehouse, get to go do that stuff, so that we understood what the firefighters were going to be going through mm-hmm. when they're doing. It. So, as a leader, as a lieutenant, you kind of knew then what their experience was. So, uh, and then you mentioned. Uh, uh, I like you, you, you didn't call it diversity of thought, but you mentioned different ideas in the room so that you could come up with the best solution, which is really a diversity of thought Yes, sir. in making sure we have that. So, so is in terms of leadership, um, who's kind of been some of the biggest influences in your life as you've grown as a leader over time so, and we can, either one of you can take it. So, um, well, oddly enough for me, uh, so president Ronald Reagan, 
Um, I was a, a, a big fan of him, I think mainly because of his steadfastness. Right. And I always aspired to be that kind of a leader. And I know he he, he was, uh, unlike our current president, he, he really tried to unite everybody mm -hmm. as one. He always referred to everything as we. Right. And, and, you know, that's how I refer to our organization. You know, we are doing this and not me. Um, so that was that was kind of I don't know, maybe I latched onto that as a, at an early age because I was younger, of course, when he was right. the president. But I've always admired that um, from him. And uh, but, you know, as uh, Brian kind of touched on it in our in our world, uh, we have kind of two different times where we employ different leadership styles. Mm -hmm. One is everyday um, leadership. But then when we're responding to an emergency it's a whole different skill set right we don't have the the um the ability of sitting back and well, let's see we want to really put water on that fire now or we want to wait a little bit you know we don't have that luxury so right. you just have to adapt for that um but another another one another individual this is a actually a fictitious person but if you recall the movie volcano um, if you haven't seen it, you watch it. It's a pretty good movie. But uh, Don Cheadle was in there, and he was the emergency management director in that movie. And it didn't matter how much was thrown at him. He handled everything with complete poise. I mean, he had phone calls, radios going off all at the same time. And I was just utterly amazed at how they built that character. And I always said, hey, when I get on a fire ground, that's the person I want to be. And it was just about the time that I was becoming a battalion chief. So being a battalion chief, that's extremely important. And I know... You've been on calls to where even at the dispatch level, if the dispatcher is yelling into the radio um, saying, oh, my God, there's there's uh, there's people trapped on the third floor that you're going to have a hard time getting to the scene. You know, automatically, everybody that's responding, their blood pressures are going right. up just because of that type of, um, of uh, what's going on. But so I always aspire to try to be like Don Cheadle was in that movie, you know, right. maintain very calm, cool and collected. And it really helps uh, when it comes to managing an incident like that. Then, and lastly, you know, you already touched on it too, but you know, all the leaders that have come that I've worked for um, uh, some of them, uh, a lot of them, most of them have been good um, and currently, and then some of them not so good. Right? right. And I think you can learn. Well, I know you can learn just as much from, not a good leader as you can right. a, a good leader. So I definitely agree with that. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I would have to say that he's absolutely right. So, you know, you really, um, in our business, we take the good and the bad we see in, in each person that we work right. with and work for. And um, we really make it our own, um, which is kind of unique in what we do. Um, I think uh, adopting the incident command system for the fire service really helped us grow as far as leadership goes. Um, I had, uh, like the chief was saying, you know, I had some uh, several battalion chiefs, um, the two that I highly respected. One of them would race us to calls and we would never get to perform any type of incident command. And the other gentleman that I worked for would take his time. He would let us get there and he would let us do our job because he wanted to know at the end of the day that if something happened in the middle of the night and he didn't show up, he wanted us to be able to run a scene right. and, and to, you know, to lead the people that, that we had out there right. with us. So um, two different styles of leadership. Um, I, I, I admired both of those individuals for the way that they did their job. Um, but their, you know, their skill sets were different in that, in that manner. So, right. but, uh, that is the interesting thing about this job, uh, being a firefighter is, is that, um, we do learn from so many different people. Right. Um, and it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a melting pot of, of ideas and, and how you get to, uh, a means end. Right. So, right. And as, uh. You know, Scott mentioned, um, you know, you lead, you know, one way in the day to day environment. And then, you know, when you're on a scene, there's a different um, sense of urgency, I guess, if you will. Uh, and what I always saw in the military was the day to day leadership done right means that when that happens, everything works right and the leadership's done right. Because now people trust you that you've built that trust into the system so that when you say something, there's Okay, now let's go execute, right? Kind of a thing. So, um, and of course, now you know you have what one, two fire stations that are in the top twenty-five for calls in the nation. Yes, right now. Yeah. yeah. So you have you have a whole different span of op, op tempo, if you will, between those stations and then the stations that, let's say, just have a lower call volume. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So how how would leaders there kind of manage the difference between those two? Well, 
you know, we, um, all comes down to the training and then the, right. and the education and, and the leaders that are at the slower stations, if you will, which there's really not that many that right. are in Pasco <laughs> County anymore that we would dub as slow. Uh, but there are, there are a couple that, you know, do less than 10 calls in a, in a day in a 24 hour period. But typically in order to get there, those are your more senior, uh, candidates. So they have already done their time, if you right. will, in a busier location. So, um, and our, our department is constantly growing and we have a, a high number of retirements that have been occurring over the last few years, just because the department is very, very young on the scale of fire department ages. And so we're having, when, when they were doing those massive hirings back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we're now we're seeing those massive retirements occurring. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of movement and because of that, we're able to move people around and they're going into those stations. Um, so we kind of have to adapt, uh, our, our leadership around that concept right. of constant movement. Okay. I would have to say, you know, the chief's right on uh, with that, you know, um, at your slower houses, um, training's a, a absolute, uh, you have to continue to do that. And as the chief says that, you know, we have a lot of our, um, tenured folks, uh, working at those stations. So, um, you know, it's kind of their job in the background to make sure that our younger, um, employees, um, build the, the trust and the knowledge and skills, the, to be ready to move forward when they do move into those uh, houses that are much busier. Right. So. You know, no, we just, um, within the last several months, merged um, a city fire station into the Pasco County Fire Service. How did leadership play a role in the lead up to that and the implementation of that? Well, wow, that's a good question, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> Especially since I used to work in that right in that city, yeah, that is kind of yeah. City yeah. Department we can right ask the yeah, former so. fire chief. We're going to ask former fire chief of Ever Hills. <laughs> so um, honestly, I think it was probably one of the best things that uh, happened for the city of Zephyr Hills uh, to come into our organization. Uh, I can tell you, as the fire chief there, uh, it's a much safer situation for the employees that are now with mm -hmm. us. Uh, that whole situation from start to finish, you know, there were a lot of, there was a lot of logistics behind it. Right. Um, so from a leadership perspective, there were so many elements within that. And, um, you know, we had a group, um, not only, uh, yourself, you were involved with it, the chief, um, we've had a lot of internal moving parts and people that were behind the scenes trying to make everything happen so that we could go in service with the city, um, on the 27th of September. So, right. So uh, it was amazing to kind of see all that uh, take take shape. And um, so there were a lot of le leadership pieces uh, within that, you know, from from upper level to to, you know, getting uh, getting all the, the trucks labeled and, and marked and ready to go on uh, opening day. Uh, right. So so leadership absolutely plays a big role in it because there, there's so many different things that you have to to take in to. Uh, keep in mind to, 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 right. to put together. So. Right. Yeah. And we had an experience a little over a decade ago with Dade right. city, right? Yep. And I think that, that obviously that was a huge component in, uh, how successful this merger went. And, you know, I can, I can say successful because, uh, we met the deadline that was put forth. Um, you know, now there's a, not, there was a top notch service there before we just made it even better. And I think it was a win-win for both the city and the county. And anytime you can get that kind of a situation, I think it's a win overall, of course. But um, because of the leadership uh, that was in place on both sides of the table, that experience that came with that leadership is really what propelled this thing in the right direction. Right. Okay. So we obviously are now nine months, eight, nine months into COVID pandemic response that's had a little impact on your operation. So talk through how, how fire rescues response to the pandemic has, or how the leadership in fire rescue has dealt with the pandemic and how you've managed to work that, that issue with, you know, your crews, how they respond and, and how we do that to make sure we keep people safe, but also still provide the service that we need to provide. Yeah. So going back to, you know, if we go back to January, Right. Nobody even knew what COVID-19 was. Right. And then fast forward 60 days and we still didn't know what it was, but we knew it was very frightening. Right. Uh, so much so that, you know, we even had a few of our firefighters that just said, I, I can't do this. And they, you know, they left our agency. But the, you know, obviously the 99.9% .9 of the rest of the folks stayed, uh, but it was a very unsure time. And it took 
the leadership in place to, you know, probably show a little more empathy than they ever had before toward our toward our uh, firefighters that are on the front lines and running into people's homes into this, you know, very scary, unknown uh, environment, not knowing if they're going to contract the disease uh, because we didn't know a lot about transmission then. Um, and, you know, having that that fear, I mean, I know we're, you know, we're, we're garnered to go and rush into burning buildings and we're around communicable diseases all the time. But this one was especially scary because there was just so un, uh, so much unknown about it. And I think from our perspective, uh, you know, especially in, in retrospect, we, we looked back and we had to provide a lot of a lot more empathy than we ever had before. But more so on the uh, the visibility side was a big issue for us because our the way our department is set up is they're used to seeing the, the, the chiefs, you know, all the staff chiefs. There's 14 chiefs from division chief all the way up to me. Mm -hmm. And every two weeks, those 14 chiefs are out in the field visiting a station. There's a, there's a, we have an assigned list. So everybody gets to visit every station, every, on every shift. Uh, but then when the pandemic hit, one of the things that we were fearful of is cross-contaminating the stations. Right. We didn't want to go from one station to another, potentially spreading the, the disease because again, we didn't know much about it. So we, Based on CDC recommendation, we stopped that. Right. And when that stopped, that was a big issue for our folks in the field because they weren't seeing us anymore. Right. They were just being bombarded with administrative orders, you know, changing the way we do things because there was so much guidance that was just pouring out of the CDC. And we were making course corrections almost every other day. And that became just so overwhelming for our folks. And then then on top of that, not seeing us. So one of the things that we did in response to that was we took advantage of the WebEx system right. and all of our, all of our battalion chiefs had already been meeting that way, but then we expanded that down into the, the captains at the stations. So they are able to do that. But then also I started, uh, I just did week number 36, I believe it was 36 video. So every week I do a, uh, 10 or 15 minute video mm -hmm. and it's just a video address of, first of all, I cover the COVID-19 stuff. And then I talk about what else is going on around the agency. So at least from that point forward, they're at least seeing me. They're, they're seeing my face that I'm still around. And, uh, you know, I speak about all the different divisions and what everybody's doing um, just to let everybody know that, hey, even though those 14 chiefs aren't out in the field, they are still working behind the scenes and we're still here. And I think that went a long way. OK, good. Brian. And of course, um, you know, uh, our total or work environment changed. Um, right. You know, we had people that suddenly we had working from home and, yeah. you know, uh, to keep that operation going. Uh, it, I think it was a good test for us, uh, believe it or not, in the beginning uh, to see that we could continue to move forward and do all the work that we had done in the past, but did it, you know, do it remotely remotely. So um, for us, uh, I don't think we really skipped a beat. Uh, we just kept pushing ahead and um, everything that we had done before we had done to just did it differently. So, right. um, but there were challenges with that as well. Um, right. the biggest challenge I think for us was just making sure that we had enough, uh, personal protective gear for everybody. Right. Um, you don't uh, normally stock up your stations with, uh, something that you're going to use for this type of situation. So, um, you know, it's, it's been a challenge maintaining, uh, the proper gear for our employees and, you know, keeping them protected. So, right. So right. Which cool. is, part about providing the tools, training resources necessary to do their job. Yes, right? Part of the people piece of yes, what sir. we do. Yeah. And I've, I've missed visiting the fire stations too. I mean, I right. spent and would randomly go to a fire station and most of the time I'd get lucky and they'd be there and just get a chance to talk to the, to, to the, the men and women that are out there. Um, well, it's equally important for us too, right. is to get that yeah. feedback. I know. You know when I, when I go to a station, you know, I get people telling me stuff that, Oh, wow, I didn't know that. So right. let me write it down right. and then right. I, we take it back and we discuss it and we, you know, make corrections. So yeah, we, yeah. we missed that. that I mean, piece. leadership yeah. from a distance is challenging. <laughs> yes. Right. There's no, 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 no question <laughs> no about it. I mean, um, no doubt. you know, and, and apparently it's something that we're going to have to continue to, to, uh, work through. It right. looks like. You yeah. Know, when I was, uh, to today, so yeah. deployed in, into Iraq and we had people at eight different locations, we still visited them, right? You still managed to travel and you visit them to see them and, and you can't, as you mentioned, cross contamination where you, you're kind of leery of, I can only imagine I walk into a fire station and I'm, I don't get the, who are you response of, I don't recognize you. I would get the, what are you doing here? Cross contaminating right. our, our area. So 
Yeah. So, <clears throat> so as we, you have 26 career stations, yes. right? Three chefs, 24 hour chefs. How do you build the leadership skills and identify leaders in that kind of environment where they're working in a small team for 24 hours in a shift? How do you do that uh, corporately and, and make sure that we're developing the next generation, if you will, of leaders? So I guess we have we're, we're a little bit of a in a unique situation to where we have we have promotional opportunities right, right. built into our system. So if you're a, a firefighter and you want to you want to be a leader, then we have an avenue for that. It's already built into the system. So you know you go and you attain the minimum requirements for that next step, yeah, whether that be a driver engineer or a captain or battalion chief, and you know all the way up. And then uh, we also have we write down to something simple like a suggestion box. We have we have suggestion boxes now that they've gone virtual as a result of the COVID nineteen <laughs> pandemic, and uh, but we we get lots of uh, feedback through that suggestion system, and we're we're able to identify probably what I would call like a shooting star. You know, somebody who's right. um, is able to. I don't know, uh, put forth a really good idea. So they keep doing that time and time and time again. You kind of set your eyes on them and you say, hey, maybe this person has some has some uh, natural born leadership abilities that we kind of keep an eye on. So they just naturally come to us. I mean, we start, we're able to see them pretty easily actually um, at our level anyway. And then we start uh, talking to them and we give them advice and how to advance in their careers. And um you know, when the opportunity presents itself, we get them in front of an interview panel and we see what they've got. Right. Yeah. So um, to, to just elaborate on that, I know um, there's a lot of collaboration in our in our office and, and there there's always discussions on how we can make things better okay. and improve upon right. the things that we do. And um, some of the discussions actually lead into how do we how do we make our officers uh, better at what they do and how can we be of support to them? Um, to get them the leadership skills to to move forward in the organization, you know, to bring them up into a battalion chief's position and then battalion chiefs forward into division chief. So um, I think we're always always kind of looking for ways to get there. Um, you know, of course, Pasco County offers ways to get there right through um, their their internal training programs right. that they offer. Um, of course, we're always behind people going to school. So um, there are quite a few people that are on our uh, job that you know, are going to college all the time. Um, right. So, you know, we're, you know, those are just a few avenues. Um, of course, we have our fire training uh, school that we've opened up classes in. So, so we're always trying to look for ways and methods to get people uh, either leadership skills or the skills they need to move to the next level. Right. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to say that, you know, I think we have a fairly good system in place, but we're always looking to improve upon it. Right. And so, you know, you were, I think what you came over from Zephyr Hills a couple of years ago now, right? Yes, sir. So tell us a little bit about the differences between a small organization, fire rescue organization like that, and how that manages with two stations, right? And then one with 26. And right. So, um, I mean, it is an interesting analogy. So, um, you know, when I had the two stations in Zephyr Hills, I only had, uh, I had the same problems, but they were minuscule to a place that has over 650 employees. So right. problems and the situations are about the same. They just um, scaled up or amped up a little bit when you're in a larger organization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Zephyr Hills, when I was there, uh, they were more concerned about what I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And they just never seemed to be looking for the, towards the future, which I can say that, you know, uh, Pasco County Fire Organization and the county itself is always looking down the road at what's coming and how we can make it better for the citizens and our employees. So uh, for me, that was a great, that was a, that was a really big thing when I came over, I was really happy to be part of something that, that was growing and, and continues to grow uh, daily. Um, you know, I have, I have a great uh, leader that I work for. So, um, and I, and like I said, I enjoy the collaboration. I don't think that I really didn't have anybody to collaborate with uh, in a small department. It was just myself and my assistant. So right. <laughs> here I have many people that I can talk with, um, you know, and uh, so from a leadership perspective, uh, there's really no comparison. Okay. And, and one question, Scott, before we kind of wrap up with, um, you, you have a union that's pretty involved in, in, in our organization. Um, 
you know, I've had a lot of conversations with leadership in how do you think our leadership philosophy here at the county impacts our relationship with the union? And, and does that impact in a good way? Or how do you think that helps or hurts that relationship? Oh, I, uh, well, having been here for 10 years now, I've, I've seen it both ways. Right. And I can clearly say that it, it certainly helps. It is the relationship with our union because of that is so much better than it ever has in the, been in the past. And I think that 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 goes all the way down through, you know, even when we have labor management meetings, that philosophy carries all the way down through there. I mean, you know, you probably watched videos or heard of people uh, that are in union negotiations and they're you know, everybody's yelling at everybody. Right. And, you know, not saying that. It, well, I do know it was like that here. It was before even me. But right. it um, now completely different landscape. Um it's, it's so much better. I think everybody understands everybody else's roles and, and the responsibilities. And it's, it's, um, yeah, it's much, much better now. And I think it's for way for the better. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, from a philosophical perspective, we're concerned with people, taking care of people. And that's kind of what the union's role is, right? Yeah. Take care of yeah. the members of the union. And so when you marry those and have the same philosophies. I think it helps. Yeah, right? Absolutely, it's a win don't always agree on everything, but I think Correct. it helps. And we understand that we're not always going to agree right. on everything, but right. it's it's done professionally, and and then the outcome in the end is usually what is the best for everybody. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Now we got a little lightning round, so you didn't get these questions in advance, but they're really quick. <laughs> more, it's it's really more of a chance for the the people watching and listening to get get to know you a little bit more because it's it kind of just tells you a little bit about. It. So, I'll just. Morning or evening, dawn or dusk? Morning. I'm an evening guy. Okay, there you go. Uh, if you could travel back in time, what period would you go to? Well, that's easy for me. 1970s. Okay. I'd go back to the 80s, I think. <laughs> the big hair. Big yes. hair, big rock. Only because I liked the TV show Emergency and, and Johnny and Roy and that time uh, frame of being a firefighter. <laughs> okay. That's it. But otherwise, I'd pick the 80s, too. They have All best right. music. All right. Um, what's your favorite season? Now, we're in Florida, so we really only have like two. Yeah. Florida. Summer and in the rest of the year. But So if I was out of the state, fall would be my favorite. Okay. okay. Interesting. Spring. Spring. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, cake or pie? Pie. Cake. <laughs> I like how these are not aligning at all. Right? That's great. That's great. Oh, it works so well together. Diversity of thought. How about that? Um, so do you speak a foreign language? Very little Spanish. Okay. No, not at all. Okay. And I'm not even sure I speak English well sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> well, how about, uh, so one, so kind of local government related parks and rec or the office sitcom parks and rec park and rec. I think the office, the office. Yeah, they're elements to both I like. Yeah. I, I think if I had to prefer, I'd land on the office, but they're elements to both that are really good. You must have saw our uh, Christmas invitation because they dressed us all up as the office. Okay. Uh, you know, on a, right, right. on a piece of paper, you know. Right. So guess who I was? <laughs> <laughs> Michael Scott. Okay. Of course. Of course. Got to be Michael Scott. Yeah. So um, tea or coffee? Neither, but tea. Okay. If I had to choose. Okay. Coffee. 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 Yeah, well, we are you, opposites, aren't we? Yeah, that's yeah. probably why we, we get along so well. Right. So, so, well, thank you, Scott and Brian, for being here. It was great to have you both uh, and get a chance to talk about leadership. And special thanks, especially to our media relations team, who really makes this effort possible. And thank you for joining us for this episode of Pasco Podcast. I'm Dan Biles, and until the next one, have a great day. Mm -hmm.